Hello and welcome to this session which is part of the RISE Conference 2020. I'm Charlotte Jones and I lead R&D at Education Development Trust which is a global education charity. I'm very pleased to share some findings from our Teachers Learning Together study in Kenya and Rwanda as the Commissioner of the Research and on behalf of a fantastic team of researchers across Education Development Trust. So this study is concerned with teacher collaborative learning in two large scale programs and I'll talk a bit through the background to the study and the programs before moving on to three early findings from the study at baseline and leaving you with some brief conclusions. The study is a really important topic uh, for us at Education Development Trust because teacher CPD is at the core of what we do. You can see some examples of our work just here uh, and this study looks at two of these programs in Rwanda and Kenya, both of which are DFID funded. And together, over three and a half thousand schools are taking part in a form of teacher collaborative learning, what we will refer to as communities of practice, and we'll abbreviate this to COPS throughout this presentation. For those of you less familiar with our work, I think it's important to say that as well as implementing, Education Development Trust has a strong commitment to the use of evidence and to generating new evidence for the global education community as part of our charitable remit. And that includes ongoing R&D to study the impact of what we do and to see how we can continuously improve it. So the motivation uh, and why does this research have a relevant beyond our own programmes? Well, we know that global expenditure on teacher CPD is huge, um, but it often fails to make any impact. Uh, we know this from recent studies, uh, and this is really a tragedy given the, the funding behind it and the commitment globally to invest in teaching quality. What we do know from the wider international evidence is that teacher collaborative learning, where teachers learn together as peers, is a highly promising strategy and it's cost effective as well. Uh, but that evidence is not enough. Uh, what we found is that there's a lack of evidence on adaptations for lower resource settings and on how to scale COPS effectively. So we've invested in this study which evaluates the impact of large scale teacher COP interventions on teacher outcomes in Kenya and Rwanda. The study also looks at the features of effective COPs and the role of school and system level actors um, in terms of COP governance and leadership and facilitation. And it's this last aspect uh, that is the focus of this presentation and I hope will really help us to answer some of the questions about scaling. In terms of the methodology, we're using a mixed methods approach uh, and both experimental and quasi-experimental designs. And note that in the Rwanda programme, we take advantage of the natural programme design where interventions are being rolled out over time, giving different exposure levels to the COP uh, medicine. We have a large sample size of over 700 teachers and nearly 200 schools across the study. So to bring things to life, here are some photos from our field work, uh, which literally went the extra mile to get these sample sizes that we targeted. So in terms of tools, I've included here a simplified theory of change. Uh, in summary, we have designed a new community of practice COP survey tool uh, for teachers, which captures some of the uh, features of COPs and expected outcomes in terms of teaching um, and impact on learners, and that's teacher self-reporting. And that's based on an analytical framework drawn from the international evidence base. And the findings in this presentation mainly draw on this COP survey tool at this stage. In terms of capturing outputs and outcomes more broadly, we're also using in this study a range of externally validated tools, um, such as um, the World Bank um, Teach tool. Um, and these will capture changes over time in aspects such as teacher self-efficacy and teaching quality. This study is quite interesting because the COPs look different in each setting. So in Rwanda, the teachers come together from across five schools to meet in a cluster um, and it's facilitated by an instructional coach who offers subject specialist expertise on literacy and math teaching. In Rwanda, it's different. Um, that's the one on the right. So the COPs are based in each school. And school subject leads offer expertise in English or maths. And the head teachers typically have a formal accountability role, ensuring that the COPs take place. 
And I want to draw your attention to the fact that although we're studying a similar set of actors um, here in the two models, the head teacher, um, some kind of subject expert, either as the coach or the school subject lead, and the teacher. These are quite different delivery models. So in Kenya, the teachers are collaborating across school boundaries. Whereas in Rwanda, the teachers are learning from peers within their own school walls. Okay, so let's move on to the three key findings from the baseline. So firstly, let's look at how governance actually works in each of the models. So who's facilitating the COPs? Um, and we can see here that this is provided by different actors typically. So in the cluster-based model in Kenya, which is the blue graph on the left, the dedicated coach tends to take the helm. In the school-based model in Rwanda, which is on the right in purple, facilitation seems to be typically shared between the school subject lead, the teachers and the head teachers. Secondly, we looked at how active teachers were in the COPs um, in terms of key decision making areas, such as selecting the meeting agenda or choosing topics for discussion and so on. And we can see that in the school based COPs, again, the purple bars, the teachers seem to be more active agents in COP governance than in Kenya in the blue bars. OK, so we've just seen how facilitation actually works. Now let's look at how far facilitation matters for COP impact. So at Endline, obviously, we'll be able to look at the attribution of COP leadership and facilitation to teach outcomes. But now at baseline, uh, we've been able to create an index of COP impact on teacher and learner outcomes based on self-reporting from the teachers. And we were able to look at correlation with facilitation quality, which we've also turned into an index. And you can see there the dimensions that these indices cover. So what did we find? Um, well, in both models, there is a moderate positive correlation between facilitation quality and impact. Um, so facilitation quality does seem to matter. Obviously, it's correlation. It's, it's not causation. We're at early stages um, here. But I think this is a promising finding. And I think it shows that the facilitation aspect of COPS is definitely worthy of attention um, in this study. And this finding does accord with the wider international evidence as well, which is something that we were keen to test. So what about the head teacher role specifically? Uh, we then wanted to deep dive on this, especially as we've just seen above, that head teachers take quite different roles in each of the Kenya and Rwanda models. So we looked at the level of head teacher engagement in COP meetings uh, using an index that we created for head teacher engagement. And we looked to see whether this had a relationship with the same COP impact index that we saw before. And you can see here the result. So it seems that head teacher engagement specifically matters, not just overall facilitation quality. Um, there is a statistically significant positive correlation with COP impact in both the cluster and the school based models. So if you remember, this is a mixed method study, and we also had insights coming through from our qualitative data. Um, there's more about this in the paper online. Um, and these qualitative findings suggested that there was a bit more going on here. There was more kind of complexity. Um, it wasn't just a simple case of the more head teacher inputs, the better for the COPs. Um, and in Rwanda, our qualitative data showed quite clearly that the head teacher role was changing over time as the COPs matured, um, with head teachers at first being quite heavily involved and directive as COPs were being set up, and then over time kind of stepping back as the COP took hold to let teachers have more control. And you can see a nice example of that in, in the quote on the slide. So prompted by these qualitative insights, we explored this maturity model further in the Rwanda programme. So we created an index for identifying two categories of head teacher leadership, a kind of directive style where head teachers participate more in the COPs and give more feedback during the COP meetings and a more distributed style, which is the opposite. And we also grouped the COPs into different performance groups. So we had the lower performing groups. Let's call these the less mature groups, as we know from our analysis that, that these map quite well onto the newest COPs. And then the higher performing um, group, so those were the more mature COPs. 
So we then ran a correlation analysis to look at the relationships. And what we see is that a directive head teacher style had a positive correlation with COP impact for low performing COPs, which you can see on the bottom left there, while for high performing COPs, it's the opposite. So there's a positive correlation with a more distributed style where the head teachers step back. So I think this really builds on the qualitative findings and it seems that teachers may benefit from head teachers stepping back as the COP matures and potentially be stifled if the head teachers remain too intrusive. And if you remember, the head teacher was not the only actor involved in the COPs in Rwanda. The school subject lead, um, who provides expert subject inputs, uh, was also involved. So what happens when we run the same analysis for this different kind of leadership role? Interestingly, we can see that the pattern is reversed. So high performing COPs, for example, seem to benefit more from directive inputs from these actors. So this really just suggests that teacher COPs need different things from different leaders at different times. So some brief conclusions. Um, so firstly, we've seen that governance and facilitation from school and system level actors does seem to matter for COP impact uh, and certainly worthy of further exploration as part of this study um, on effective COPs. Um, and we'd really love to see more research on these middle tier actors as they're so essential for successful large scale implementation. Secondly, um, I think teacher ownership and peer leadership are also emerging as important aspects of COP governance. Um, I think an area to consider is whether the cluster based models, which if you remember had stronger coordination um, from a coach um, as they're working across schools, um, whether they're somehow undermining the capacity of teachers to self organize and their ownership of the COPs and to what extent that that matters, for example, for sustainability. Thirdly, when it comes to the leadership of teacher cops, there really does seem to be no one size fits all. There are various dependencies and contextual factors that we've um, had a look at as part of this first study. So firstly, we've seen how successful leadership styles might depend on the maturity of the cop. Secondly, we've um, seen also how good leadership depends on the specific leadership role we're actually talking about. We've seen that subject experts, for example, play a different leadership role um, from head teachers. And obviously that has implications for how we train and how we prepare leaders uh, when we go to scale. Thirdly, what good leadership looks like may depend on the delivery model. So we've already seen differences between the cluster based model and the school based model um, based on these initial findings. And of course, there are interactions between these contextual factors as well. So a clear case here, I think, for us to pay more attention to leadership practices and governance processes, not just levels of leadership inputs, um, and how far a collaborative culture that we know is essential for COPs might be promoted by deliberate leadership practices. Again, something we can think about when preparing and training um, leaders on our programmes. So that's something we really want to know to help us with scaling in the future. And it's something we're going to be looking at. Um, we're going to be trying to find some simple tools or some new items potentially for our existing tools that might help us to better capture leadership practices for the end line. So finally, I'd like to thank the programme funder, DFID, and the programme teams, including all of our many implementation partners across both countries, for their collaborative efforts in the study design and their engagement in the findings so far. Myself and the wider research team would welcome comments on the paper, which is available on the RISE website.